Uh, we're at the last, the fourth week of our series on gratitude, uh, just kind of wrapping up this concept of looking at a, a deeper way to live out a grateful life, like not just one day a year, but every day of the year. How do we live in this posture, live in this mindset, live in this attitude of always being grateful? And as Christians, if you follow Jesus, if you profess Jesus to be Lord and Savior of you, there ought not be anybody on the planet more grateful every day than us. I mean, when we start to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, what he sacrificed for me, I can't go on living the same way that I did before I came to know this. It changes the way I live. It changes the posture of my heart. It changes everything about me because now I'm so grateful for what he has done. I didn't deserve it, and yet he did it anyway, and that gratitude should impact every part of my being. In a world where we take so much for granted, and specifically in a part of the world where we have so much we can take for granted, not only is it good to give thanks, but it's this incredible posture that God teaches us, shows us, and presents to us that living from a posture of gratitude changes my attitude, changes my actions, changes my perspective, and changes my response. See, being grateful is not a natural response. When you were born and and the first time you got your diaper changed, the first time you got to eat, the first time you got a toy, your natural response wasn't to say grateful or to be grateful or to say thankful thoughts or thankful words or thankful expressions. Our first response was, it's mine, I deserve it, you owe it to me. And since then, we've learned that God created us to be grateful. Now, we can be honest, like the reasons we're not great at being grateful or great at being thankful could be pride. Sometimes we just want to take the credit for ourselves. It could be that we're just self-centered. I mean, that's a fallen human characteristic. But to be honest, for most of us, it's just that we just get busy. Like I intend to be thankful, more thankful than I am. I intend to express gratitude more often than I get it done. But the reality is life happens and I get busy and I get behind. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the story where Jesus had approached 10 guys with leprosy and he healed all 10 of them. But only one of the 10 took the time to come back and to give thanks. The other nine missed the moment to return thanks to Jesus for the healing that he provided. Why? Because gratitude is not a normal response. And often we, we have so much to be grateful for, we just don't take the time to reflect, to pause, and to give thanks. It takes intentionality. It takes specifically setting out to first see through the perspective of all that I have to be grateful for, and then to respond. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's not like not saying anything or not expressing anything is no big deal. In fact, we said this, ingratitude is not neutral. It's never neutral. Every time I have an opportunity to express gratitude and I don't, it communicates something. Not doing something, not saying something still says something. In fact, we said this, unexpressed gratitude actually communicates ungratefulness. I can feel incredibly grateful for you, but if I don't express that, what you feel is the opposite of my gratefulness. Because if I feel it and don't express it, what you feel is taken advantage of. And if I feel it but don't express it, what you feel is that you were not even worthy of the time it took to say thanks. If I don't take intentional steps to demonstrate my thankfulness, my gratitude, I will appear as an unappreciative person to the person who feels unappreciated. The thing is, if we take time, there are always things we can find to be grateful for. There are always people that we can find to be grateful for. There are always things that our God does to provide, to give, to inspire that we can be so grateful for. Even when things aren't ideal, there's something to be grateful for. And even when things take longer than you hope, there's still something to be grateful for. And even in the times of life that are hard, there's something to be grateful for. In fact, we said it like this, every opportunity to grumble is an opportunity to be grateful. All that changes is my perspective. I can find stuff to whine about. I can find stuff to complain about. Anything that I'm looking for, I will always find. But every opportunity I have to grumble about how bad things are, how long things are taken, is also an opportunity just to be grateful for what I do have. Last week, Pastor Brent talked to us about the tension between living in a broken world, but also understanding that I always have something to be grateful for, that I can give thanks in all circumstances. No matter what the situation, there's always something that I can be thankful for. I was reading an article this week, and I thought it was so fitting to where we are in this series. The article says, and I'll draw a conclusion, our understanding of gratitude is directly tied to our maturity. We know people who are immature, and immaturity often leads to feelings of entitlement, being overly emotional, and being very unsettled or not being at peace. 
which if you know people, and sometimes I'm this person who describes my life as a roller coaster, right? Those incredible highs where the adrenaline is flowing, things are going great, and I'm just up here, followed by the dip, the dive, the valley, the low. And that wears us out, and it's hard on our emotion, it's hard on our psyche, it's hard on our mental health. There's so many things that this roller coaster does that feels so good for a moment, but the reality is it does no good for us. Maturity helps to level things out, but not that we ignore bad things and not that we ignore emotions and how we feel. That's not a sign of maturity either. That's just ignoring reality. But maturity helps us to recognize this is what's going on and this is how I feel, but I can still maintain good and peace and joy, life. I can still maintain all these incredible things. It's understanding just because this circumstance happened doesn't mean my life has to be dictated by how I feel about those circumstances. Maturity is understanding that my emotions don't have to dictate my life. For a mature person, life is much less like a roller coaster. And I read a Rick Warren devotional one time and he used this analogy. I thought it was so fitting that life is not like a roller coaster for a mature believer. It's like a train track or a train ride. Still two rails, And on one rail, if you can envision at any given moment of life, on one side, on one rail, there are things that you wish were better. At any given moment, you wish something was better than it is. At any given moment, you wish you didn't have to go through what you're going through here. But on the second rail, at every given moment of your life, there are things to be grateful for. And when I understand this isn't perfect, but I can be grateful for this, life levels out like riding on a train to where you can experience joy and you can experience peace and you can live from a position and a posture of gratitude that helps you see that life is going to be fine because this isn't the life that I spend my eternity in anyway. At any given time, there are things that I can be grateful for. There will always be things I wish I can improve, sometimes more drastic than others, but there is always things to be grateful for in this very This concept that Jesus teaches, that Jesus models for us, being grateful, expressing gratitude, it plays such a key role in our walk, in our journey to become more and more like him. Grateful thoughts, they help to neutralize anxious thoughts. It's one of the most proven tools for capturing an anxious thought and making it obedient to Christ, to replace my thoughts of anxiety with words of gratitude. Because anxious thoughts and a grateful heart can't coexist. They can't occupy the same space. They can't take up the same bandwidth in our lives. Anxious thoughts will be pressed out of the way by grateful thoughts and grateful words. Max Lucado says in a study, he says this, the grateful heart is the peaceful heart. The surest way to be peaceful is to be grateful. His tip, when anxious thoughts bubble up inside of you, pause and give thanks, not just think it, but give thanks, say it, write it, give thanks for 10 things and watch anxiety leave. Our anxious thoughts can be pushed out of the way, can be overpowered by our grateful heart and our gratitude. But gratitude overpowers entitlement. We, we could argue all day long. We live in the most entitled world in the history of mankind, but gratitude overpowers entitlement. Gratitude reduces complaining. I was gonna say eliminates, but let's be honest, we can always find something to complain about. But gratitude reduces complaining. Gratitude, gratitude it diffuses comparison. But we can be experts at comparing ourselves to other people. But every time we do it, or nearly every time we compare ourselves to someone else is what we're looking for. We wish we had what they had. We wish we had more of what they had. We wish our life was more like theirs. And it causes us to get to a place of such a discontented heart where it just doesn't work. Comparison leads to envy. Comparison leads to entitlement. It leads to discontentment. It leads to grumbling. But gratitude forces out comparison. Gratitude increases contentment. It's recognizing I may not have everything I want, but I've got plenty of everything that I need. And it changes my perspective on how I live. So many people in our life will never experience the peace that God intended for us because we're convinced that the answer to all my life's problems is just more. You give me more of this and my life will be better and then I can experience peace. If I just had more money, then I could get what I want and I'd experience more peace. If I just had more stuff, if I just had more time, if I just had more good relationships, then my life would be better But the problem is when more is our goal, the finish line just keeps moving farther and farther away because I'll never have more that I want. So instead, Jesus teaches us this incredible principle of posturing our heart, posturing our thoughts, our our thoughts, our thoughts. (laughs) Whew, it's gonna be a good day. Posturing our thoughts to express gratitude, to be looking for ways 
to be grateful, that I see through the filter of everything that happens, what can I find to be grateful in this? Our gratitude helps with our contentment. Gratitude helps deepen relationships. If you've got relationships that struggle, it may not be the cause, but I can promise you part of the reason that your relationships struggle is because the person that you're working with, they don't make you feel grateful, which makes the opposite true and really hard to hear. It may be the reason that people have problems with you in relationships is because they don't feel appreciated by you. We don't feel appreciated, it damages relationships and gratitude helps strengthen relationships. Embedded in all of this is so many attributes and characteristics of how God designed our relationship with him to be. That God would use gratitude and a grateful heart to draw us closer to him. That he would use gratitude and a grateful heart to make us to become more like Jesus. And that we would use gratitude and a grateful heart to become further and way, further away from the old, dead, selfish, self-centered me that I was before I came to know Jesus. There is power in being grateful. You could even argue there, there is fruit from being grateful, as a result of being grateful. Grateful heart produces things like honor and respect. It produces empathy and patience. It produces kindness and generosity. And who could argue in my home, I don't need any more of those? Who goes to work in the morning thinking, you know what, I don't need any more empathy at work. (laughs) I don't need anybody to be patient with me at work. It is so good here. If that's where you work, I'd like to apply. That'd be a good place to work. If you, maybe you go home at night and you think, you know what, we don't need any more honor in our home. But we don't need any more kindness or generosity here. But the reality is the, the fruit, the proven fruit of gratitude is honor, respect, empathy, kindness, generosity, patience, so many good things that God uses to work out to become more like Christ. Every place people gather, there is a culture. Culture is the, the customs, the practices, the achievements, the, the things that people regard in a group. So there is a culture in your home. People gather there, there's a culture. There's a culture in your friend circles. People gather, there is a culture. If you're a student, there is a culture in your class. There is a culture on your team. Anywhere people gather, there is a culture. In every church, there is a culture. Culture is shaped by habits, by opinions, and by preferences. You know this. You just maybe don't think about it all the time. There is a culture in every home. And if you go into a home where the culture is different than yours, you become very aware very quickly. If you are a family who don't mind wearing your shoes inside the house and you go visit someone who does not allow shoes to be worn inside the house, you immediately walk in the door and start to replay what it was like at 6.45 this morning when your alarm went off and you put on those socks that you're not positive matched. Or maybe it's the one that's got the hole in the heel and you're feeling around for it. Is this the one with the hole? It's going to be so embarrassing because I didn't know I had to take my shoes off when I walked in the house. Or if you're the opposite of that, you are the house where people don't wear shoes, and then you walk into someone's house where they're wearing shoes everywhere, shoes up on the couch, shoes up in the chair, and you're like, this is disgusting. How does anyone live like this? It's a different culture. It's a culture shock. Maybe when you were younger and you went over to your friend's house for the sleepover, and maybe you were a house, so you were at home where the culture was very quiet. We didn't argue. We didn't discuss our problems publicly. And this culture is you just talk at level nine. Culture shock, right? Like, we don't talk like this. Are y'all mad at each other all the time? This is not what I'm accustomed to. What have I walked into? Every, every home, every gathering of people has a culture. You walk into a restaurant. Every restaurant you walk in to sit at has a culture. When they take your order, there is a culture. You can, you can order chicken at Chick-fil-A, at Popeye's, at Cane's, at uh, KFC, and everywhere you go, they're ser- serving the same bird, some fries, and a soda. But what do we know? The culture at every one of those is different. The Chick-fil-A, what makes them so notable, so good, is their sauce and their culture. That's what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen? I know they're closed on Sunday. We won't hold that against them today. It's the culture, right? It's different. It's my pleasure. It's that the employees actually act like they want to serve you. Thank you for the salt. It's my pleasure. You don't get that at all the other restaurants? It's a different culture. Can I just offer this? Every gathering of people has a culture that was established either intentionally or by default. Chick-fil-A did not accidentally come across it's my pleasure at every restaurant. They intentionally took steps, put habits in place, put trainings in place that every employee knows I get to serve you. It's a different mindset. It's a different culture. Every gathering of people has has a moment, has lots of intentional moments or lots of sequenced moments where you can intentionally build the culture that you desire or by default to build the culture that's easiest. By default, we'll build a culture that's laziest. By default, we'll build a culture that's entitled. 
So what I want to do today as we conclude this series, and what I want to give is just some application steps right out of the scripture about how we can help to build a culture that best reflects Jesus by living a life of gratitude in every gathering that we're in. So whether it's your home, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your team, wherever you gather with friends, with people, with coworkers, you have a role to play in changing the culture when it comes to gratitude, to move from a culture of entitlement to a culture of being grateful, to move from distant to being engaged, to move from disconnection to appreciation. If you're taking notes, we'll jump right into number one. To be grateful by example. Like so many things, even if I have a level of influence, I can't just change a culture or help improve a culture by telling someone else what to do. I have to be willing to demonstrate it myself. I can't build a culture of gratitude if I'm just telling my kids how they need to be more grateful. I need to model what it looks like to be more grateful. I can't just tell other people they need to get better at it. I have to get better at it myself. I have to live it out. I have to live out the example. I love that Jesus didn't just instruct us, you need to be thankful. Jesus didn't just point out, nine of y'all didn't come back to say thankful, what's wrong with you? Jesus modeled it. He set the example. He showed us what it looked like. John chapter six, one of my favorite stories, John chapter six is when the disciples went and borrowed the little boy's fish and biscuits, little basket, and they brought it to Jesus with no clue of how he was gonna use that little happy meal number three to give to 5,000 people. And they bring it to Jesus And the very first thing that Jesus does when he receives this little fish nugget happy meal was give thanks to God for providing. To the average person, that makes no sense at all. There are 5,000 men plus women and children all hungry and you have a happy meal with some fish nuggets. What do you plan to give thanks for? That you get to eat, nobody else does, but then if you know the miracle, then they feed and they have lots and lots of leftovers. Jesus started the miracle with thanks for your provision. And then he moved on to thanks for what you're going to do. This is a whole nother sermon right here, but I'm about to preach for a minute today. Some of us might see God in a whole new light. Some of us might see our faith stretch in ways we never dreamed possible. Some of us need to have God to show us from a different perspective that it's not in us to just wait until God performs the miracle to say thank you for what he has done. It's not waiting until God changes the circumstances to have a posture of gratitude before God changes the circumstance. It's that in the battle, it's that in what's going on, it's in the challenge that we thank God for what we're believing him to do. Jesus thanked God for feeding before he fed the first plate. Jesus thanked God for feeding before he did what he was going to do. There are promises in scripture that God says he will fulfill and we can begin to thank God for those very promises. There are times when we pray and ask God to do things and we can thank God for the healing that he is bringing. We can thank God for the wisdom for that he is going and promised to give us. We can thank God for softening the heart of the family member who is far from him and for God drawing that person. And they haven't reached him yet. They haven't made it back yet, but we are thanking God through faith that he is working to bring them back. John chapter 11, Jesus sits with his disciples for one of the the last gatherings they would have. It's the last supper together. John chapter 11, Jesus, I'm not sorry. John chapter 11 is when Jesus is almost to go sit with his disciples for his last meal. And instead he gets distracted. He gets pulled away to one of his best friends who had just died. And if you know the story, it's really dramatic. The family is mad with him. Jesus, why didn't you come earlier that you could have healed him? And Jesus is like, listen, I don't need to be here then. I can be here right now. But before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, the first thing he does is pray. And he thanks God for hearing him. And then he shouts into the tomb, Lazarus come out and the dead man comes walking out the tomb. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22 is where Jesus is sitting with his disciples for the last meal, for his last supper. And as he's preparing to dine with them before he does any explanation of what's about to happen, Luke 22 and verse 19, Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to his disciples. Our prayer should never be for show. Like one of the convictions that I've had on my heart as long as I've been a pastor is that I don't ever want to get a compliment for how good my prayers sounded, for how well I articulated my prayers because I don't want prayer to be about me. If it's about me, take me off the stage, quiet me, silence me, whatever you need to do because the prayer is about encountering our God and reaching out to him. But... If you're a parent, if you're an influencer in any way, you don't pray so that you can be heard. But parents, if your kids have never heard you pray and seen you pray, the only conclusion that they will draw is that prayer is not important to you. We should never, we should never worship for our own attention. 
We should never worship in that my voice is the one. It's, it's better for all of you if we worship and you don't hear my voice. But we should never worship from a place where we are seeking attention of man. Our worship is for an audience of one that Jesus is honored by our worship. But parents, I'll argue all day long that the parent of the child in the room with them as they worship, there's no one more influential than them. We don't worship so that we can be seen by others, but I'm okay with it if someone sees me worship because I want my kids to know that worship is a big deal to me. And if my kids never see me worship, they're, not, they're gonna think that it's not. You are a worship leader in your family. You are a prayer leader in your family. You are an influencer in the faith. I, I want my kids to catch me praying. I'm not praying so that they see me, but I want them to catch me. I want my kids to see me worship. I don't worship so they see me, but I want them to see me worshiping. I love how Paul describes it like this. First Corinthians chapter one and verse four, he expands on this concept. He says, I always thank my God for you, for the gracious gift he's given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Paul's doing this incredible thing where he's giving thanks to God and modeling what it looks like to give thanks to God. What would be different in your house if you sat down a couple nights a week for dinner and you went around the room and you gave thanks to God for every person sitting at your table? But what would it look like for you this week if you walk into your break room and before you took that first bite of your lunch, you gave thanks to God for everyone in the break room? But what would it look like if you walked into the break room and you gave thanks to God for your boss? Not thanking God through faith that they get a flat tire on the way home that day, but thanking God that you have a boss and maybe they're not perfect, but you can still be grateful that you have the job. What would change in your perspective? What would change in the culture? What would change if you thank God for your classmates while you're in the class? What would, what would change if you thank God for your teammates, even your teammate that doesn't pass you the ball? What would change if you thank God for the people that he has put in your life? Be the person who gets to work early and write a couple thank you notes. But be the person who goes to bed at night and before you do, you tuck your kids in and you tell them why you're thankful for them. Be the person who, who, when they sit down in a conversation, before you start the conversation, you just validate them and tell them why you're grateful for them. You mean to tell me I need to thank my kids for doing the chores that I had to nag them to do? You don't have to. But if you wanna see the culture in your home change, you need to. Start the change, be the example. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, I always thank God for you. Every Sunday we get together and I love our Sunday morning gatherings and we always start with worship. And it's not because we needed a place to be able to take people who are musicians and singers and put them somewhere where they can use their gifts. It's to set the tone and the culture of our heart. It's that when we best hear from the Lord is when our heart is fertile ground for that to happen. And singing our praises of thanksgiving to our God is one of the most powerful ways to posture ourselves to hear from the Lord. I would encourage you with this. If you're in a rut in your prayer time, or even if you're not, I started doing this a few years ago and it changed the way that I pray altogether that when I pray, my first words are, God, I thank you. It changes the way the rest of my prayer goes. It changes the way the rest of my prayer flows. Before I bring my request, before I give the information, before I vent to you, God, I'm thankful for this, and I'm thankful for them. Listen, if you're brand new in your faith and you're trying to figure out, I don't even know how to pray, can I just offer this? One of the best ways to learn to begin to pray is just to thank God for the things that he brings to your mind and to your heart. I thank you that you woke me up this morning. I thank you for the air that's in my lungs. I thank you that I may not love my job, but I have a job that I can provide for myself. I thank you for the people that you've brought around me that I can do the things that you've called me to do. Be grateful and be grateful by example. Number two, make gratitude common. If we wanna build a culture of gratitude in any gathering that we're in, whether it's family, home, work, class, team, whatever, if we wanna build a culture of gratitude, it needs to be discussed often, it needs to be modeled regularly, and it needs to be implemented consistently. It's things that we do on a regular basis. It's things that we do that if we get so common with it that we don't do it, something feels incomplete. We've, we've done this, we've had the interaction, but the circle didn't close because we didn't come back to give thanks. Make gratitude common. Make gratitude where we can express it, where we can replicate it, where we can demonstrate it, and then repeat. Make gratitude common. One of my goals, just a personal goal that I had at the very beginning of this year, I was sitting down at the beginning of the year, I always pray, usually the last week of December, and ask God to show me a couple things that I need to work on to improve. And one of the goals that I'd never thought of before, I'd never heard of anyone doing this, I just thought it was a good practice, that if, if someone or something brought a name or a face to my mind, to my memory, that I would pause whatever I'm doing, 
I would reach out to that person and either offer to pray for them or appreciate them. Now, this isn't some super holy moment, but can I tell you, this has become one of the favorite practices that I have. Not just as a pastor, just as a human. That when God puts someone in my heart, see, here's the assumption that I made, that if God was gonna put somebody on my mind, that either they needed some prayer or attention or they needed to feel more appreciated. And it didn't happen every time. I'm not gonna over glorify it, but can I tell you the number of times I reached out to someone who said, Pastor, you have no idea what we're going through today. Pastor, you have no idea how unappreciated I felt this whole week and out of the blue. Can I just offer it? You can have that. It's free of charge. You can implement that. There's no copyright to this whatsoever. Allow God to speak to you about what you need to do to encourage and thank the people around you, to appreciate the people around you. A couple weeks ago, we passed out a couple thousand thank you cards. And the idea wasn't that everybody in the church writes a thank you card one day a year. But what if you became the person who wrote thank you cards on a consistent basis? Well, pastor, that's really not the kind of person I am. Well, praise God Almighty, you are a new creation through Christ Jesus, and you can become a thank you card writer. Amen? I got giggles and said amen. Do you believe that? Make expressing gratitude part of our everyday language. A couple years ago, Katie and I, we kind of shifted the way that we try to implement this into our lives. We went to a conference and the the guy talked about how simple and subtle this was and how much impact it made. And we were like, yeah, let's give it a try. For some reason, our kids like to do things like um, all of our kids, all four of our kids love to take pictures of the sunset. Like just, we'll be driving down the road even before they had a phone. Like, dad, can I see your phone? I wanna take a picture of the sunset. Look how pretty it is. I don't know why, but all four kids just really love to do this. I've encouraged them and tried to inspire them. I'm like, hey, the sun rises are just as pretty, but nobody seems to care about that. But what we tried to change wasn't some theological shift in in the way we approached our kids and parenting our kids. What we changed was simply when our kids appreciate something like, look how beautiful the sunset is, we changed it to look how beautiful the sunset that God created is. It changes our perspective. And the more consistently we say things like that, it reframes how we appreciate what God has done for us. Yes, the sunset is beautiful. And even an atheist would admit the sunset is beautiful. But what speaks so much to us is that we know that the creator of the universe painted that for his kids. So God, we are grateful that you painted that for us. We are thankful for your creativity and your design. We are grateful for this beautiful sunset. Colossians chapter four and verse two, Paul writes like this. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Now I'm gonna break this down like we're breaking down a math problem. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and devote yourselves to prayer with a thankful heart. This wasn't just to try to fill in the blank concept. Paul says, devote yourself to prayer with a thankful heart. What's devote mean? To make it common, to do it so often it becomes part of who you are, to do it so consistently that it's common in all that you do so that everything I say and every deed I perform and every word I speak and perform to to anyone else is all founded and grounded in this came from a thankful heart. This part may be uncomfortable for some of us and I understand why and I'll unpack that in a second. But if we're going to make gratitude common, then we have to get more comfortable in how we respond to gratitude. There's this stereotype with Christians, and I get it and I understand it. But if we're being honest, Christian folks can sometimes get really weird when someone says thank you. And I understand why. Like, we don't want pride to have a crack to enter into our heart. We want to be humble in all that we do. We want to point people back to Jesus. All good. All right. But if someone offers you an expression of gratitude, and you make it really weird and uncomfortable for them, they're not gonna express gratitude to anybody else. Because our awkwardness and our uncomfortability is gonna force them to think this is how all people are and I shouldn't offer it. And it might even impact the way they express their gratitude to God. Now, I'm not saying take all the credit, absorb it all, let your head swell up real big. I get it, remain humble. Don't allow pride a foothold. But if we don't learn as believers how to accept gratitude well, we might actually do some detrimental steps to someone who's learning how to express it. Your welcome is perfectly acceptable. Maybe for you, give it some thought. I know some people that have some really awesome, amazing responses. Well, man, thank you for telling me that. I'm so appreciative. I'm just trying to use the gifts that God has given me to do the very things God's called me to do. Perfectly reasonable response. You're not taking credit for it. You're pushing people back to God, but it's okay to respond in a way to where they know like it's good to offer gratitude to someone else. Here's the thing, it is a big deal. And so many times I find myself, someone says thank you and I'll say something like, 
oh, it's no big deal. But listen, if it was a big enough deal that they felt led to say thank you, I don't want to squash it and make their big deal a little deal because of my awkwardness. What if we were practice prepared to respond to someone's appreciation and gratitude? Don't devalue someone else's gratefulness. Don't diminish someone else's expression of being grateful. When someone says thank you, respond in a way that honors them and honors our God. Number three, leads right into this. Probably the most important one. All praise goes back to God. It's good when someone says thank you to me, but all praise goes back to God. It's where we got this idea of let's pray before we eat. I mean, it's, it's one of the things we practice most in our culture. Like that's, that's the staple in the Midwest, right? Like we are gonna pray before meals. You don't pray before salad. You don't pray before dinner rolls. You don't pray before the bread. You pray before the meat, good food, good meat, good God. Let's eat, let's go. But if that's the only time that we pause to give thanks to our God for what he has done, we're really not establishing even a culture of gratitude in our own hearts. We're practicing it, but we're just checking the box. Yep, I said thank you. And I get the the fullness. I mean, some people pray such an eloquent prayer before a meal. Thank you for the hands that prepared it. Thank you for the people that did these things. Thank you, God, for your provision that we could eat today. I get it. I understand it. But if we're going to build a culture of gratitude, first in me and then in the people around me, it can't just be praying before a couple meals a day. If we're going to catch it, it's a beautiful sunset. No, it's a beautiful sunset that my God has provided for me. If we're going to catch it before my kids go to sleep at night, I'm so grateful for every last one of them. Every good thing comes from God. And our natural human tendency is to concentrate on the negative more than the positive. If you go in for a review with your boss and they give you 10 positive things and one needs improvement, what do you walk out of that meeting remembering? Man, my boss was harsh because I got something I need to work on. This negative bias in our life, it applies in our faith, which is what has me convinced this is a tool and a weapon of the enemy. God can provide for us a hundred things to be grateful for. And what do we get fixated on? The one thing that's not as good as we wanted the one thing that didn't come as fast as we wanted and hoped for. This negative bias is eliminated with our attitude and our heart and our posture of gratitude. Church, if you wanna see a culture of gratitude form in your home, in your classroom, in your workspace, in your friend group, and in your own heart, to have a bend, to be grateful for all that God has done in me, and through me, and for me, changes everything. Gratitude is not natural. It doesn't come as a natural response. Our default is never gonna be, let me pause for a minute and just be wowed by the goodness of my God. But when I intentionally take time to reflect on what he's done, who he is, and what he will do. Listen, I get it. It's easy to get busy. And it's easy to take things for granted when you've seen so many good things. And it's easy to get complacent and easy to feel entitled And life doesn't stop and time is limited and everybody wants to see so much more of your time that I love the simplicity and the truthfulness of the psalmist. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 14. One sentence changes everything. It's not even a full sentence. It's a sentence fragment. Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God. I love the word sacrifice in this text because sacrifice by definition means that it costs you something. When was the last time that your gratitude cost you something? We don't even want our gratitude to inconvenience me, let alone cost me. This isn't just a practice for Christ followers. This isn't just a recommended thing to do for the Christian. That all praise must go back to God. Because anything that, that, anything that doesn't turn praise back to God turns to pride in me. Admiration, appreciation validation, all good, all make me feel good. But if I don't point that back to God, that will put a seed in me that grows into pride that competes with the spirit that forces the Holy Spirit to pause. Gratitude, acting in gratitude, a sacrifice of appreciation, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's not look at me. It's not look what I've done. Look at how helpful I've been. Look, I'm a big deal. Instead, It's a sacrifice of thankfulness. To make thankfulness, to make thankful thoughts, to make praises of thanksgiving, to make expressing my gratitude, my sacrifice to our God. It changes everything about me. So I'll sacrifice any attention that's ever given to me to push it back to God. 
It's not that I want to be made known and I want to be made famous. And if that ever pops up in me, I will leave this stage because I want Jesus to be center stage. And I'll pause in this moment, even though I'm busy, and I will give thanks to my God. And I will pause in the circumstance where even it's not in my favor and any that doesn't feel well and it feels like a battle and a challenge, I will pause and I will still find ways to give thanks to my God. And I'll set aside what I wanted to do to make sure to thank him for what he has already done. There are so many people in this church that come together every week and sacrifice through thankfulness. So I wanna thank our greeters who have to set a culture that every week stand at every door and they make this place warm and welcoming and friendly. Thank you for your sacrifice in greeting other people. And I wanna thank our coffee shop and our kitchen folks who get here every week to sacrifice, to make the food, to prepare the food, to create an environment where people can build community, make connections and grow in their relationships with other Christians. I wanna thank our children's church workers. Oh, how I wanna thank our children's church workers. Not because they babysit our littles so that we can have a gathering, but because they are pouring into our kiddos truth with love and grace, foundations of our faith founded in Christ Jesus on who he is and what he has done. I am thankful for our children's church workers. I wanna thank our worship team who come in every week and sacrifice hours of time and talent to come in and help usher us into the presence of the Lord. I'm so thankful for our worship team. I wanna thank our tech team and our camera crew, the, the team that comes and makes this experience everything that it is and tears down the walls of our buildings to make the gospel and the truth of Jesus that can reach in so many other parts of the world. I wanna thank our ministries like Celebrate Recovery who 52 weeks a year come together and they minister to people who are far from Jesus to come to know him and to find freedom in who he is and what he has offered. I wanna thank our small group leaders who don't always have all the qualifications they think they need, but they sit in the trenches with people who are going through life trying to figure that out and they've sat and said, you know what, I don't have the answers, but I know the savior who does. I wanna thank our student ministries who are sitting with our teenagers the ones that you want to get out of your house, because I know I do. And they sit with them and they love on them and they encourage them through the messiness of the teenage years, not just to survive them, but to thrive in their faith in those teenage years so that they can moving from borrowing their faith to owning their faith. I want to thank those of you who are faithful stewards of God's resources, of the finances that God has given you to oversee, to return that back to the church because your giving and your generosity allows this church to be a church that goes to meet people where they are to help them take their next step with Christ. I want to thank our leaders and our lay leaders and our board members and our staff who willingly sacrifice because of the gratitude in their heart for what God has done for them, that we make an impact in this community. All of the credit goes to God, but a big thank you goes to each one of you because of your service. Absolutely. Can we just real quick? Because of your faithful service and your faithful sacrifice, this church is a blessing to many. I love the way Paul summarizes it. Colossians chapter three. Starting in verse 12, he says this. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself. Not just consider it, not just think about it. You must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all else, Close yourself with love, which binds us all together, one church working together. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its riches, richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with a thankful heart. We have an enemy. When the enemy wants you to feel left out, gratitude reminds you that God will lift you back up. And the enemy wants you to feel alone, but gratitude will remind you that you are loved. And the world wants you to see how unfair life is, but gratitude will show you the good grace of our God. And the devil wants you to think that everything is stacked against you. But gratitude reminds us that God uses all things and works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The enemy wants you to focus on what you're missing. And gratitude reminds you all the ways that God provides. 
The enemy wants you to think that you're so disconnected and that gratitude reminds you all the ways that you're cared for. The enemy wants you to live in the darkness, but gratitude lets the light in. It's gratitude in every situation that turns my attention back to my heavenly father. It's gratitude, the sacrifice of thankfulness to my God that opens the door for his joy to return. When my praise and my thanksgiving is a sacrifice, peace is my privilege. So I want to encourage you today before we go, as we wrap up this series, as we start to live, not just this week of Thanksgiving, but this life of giving thanks, I want to invite you to stand to your feet and we're going to sing our praises just like we started today out. I want to encourage you that no matter what circumstance you're in, I want to encourage you that no matter what life challenge you're going through, there are two tracks to the railroad and we have so much to be grateful for. I want to encourage you as you go into this Thanksgiving season that it doesn't end on Friday, that we don't move on to the next season or to the next thing, but that we as followers and believers, we sit in a position and we stand in a position where we can give thanks in all circumstances. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. I thank you that as we sing these songs to you today, God, this is the true reflection of our attitude of gratitude. I thank you that as we start to work through some of the things and the challenges we focused on, God, help us to push those to the side to remember the goodness of who you are, the grace you've extended us, and the love that you have poured out for each. God, as I lift my voice, let my words be a song of honor, of gratitude, of appreciation for who you are and all that you've done. As I stretch out my hands, God, let this be a sign of surrender, that all that I have, all that I am is only because of you. God, as we worship you, let my worship be the greatest form of thanks that I can give. In Jesus' name.